Good morning and welcome to Leatherwood. Here's what you need to know. If you're a first time guest or a recent guest, we hope you felt welcome as you entered in today. Yes, we have one request of you and that is as you leave today, if you wouldn't mind going by our Welcome Center, getting a guest card, filling that out and exchanging it for a gift from us. Here at Leatherwood, we believe that small groups are the strength of our church and many of them have started back already and more to come. And we know that small groups being the strength of our church, you're looking forward to those coming back and we're making sure that we do that in a safe manner. So if you want more information about small groups, go out to our Welcome Center today, indicate that in the comment section of the guest card and we'll get you some more information about small groups really quickly. Here at Leatherwood, we have a new member slash prospective members class called Discover Leatherwood. It meets for two sessions with the pastor and other staff, and we answer any questions you have about our church, give you some great information to help you make the most informed decision about whether or not this is where God wants you to serve His church. At Leatherwood, we have many easy ways to give, so please pick the one that's best for you. You can give online or our website, easytithe.com backslash LBCAL. You can give in the offering plates as you leave today. You can mail it in or drop it by the church. And thank you so much, church, for your faithful contributions. This coming Wednesday, Brother Mike will be starting a study for adults out under the tent at 6.30 p.m. You want to make sure that you join us for that. Also at 6.30, we'll be having family night where student age all the way down and their parents that want to come can come and we can have a midweek Wednesday night worship service in the sanctuary. We want to thank you so much again for being here today. We know that you have options and we don't take it lightly that you've chosen to worship with us today. So guests, don't forget to fill out that guest card. If you need anything from us at all, do not hesitate to ask. And we hope to see you back next week. Tries to roll over my bone When sorrow comes to steal the joy when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy, when brokenness and pain is all I know,
Thank you for all your many blessings, Lord. I just thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you show us each and every day. <clears throat> Lord, I just thank you that we can stand in your love. No matter what comes our way, we can stand strong in your love. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you just bless the remainder of this service. Lord. Just touch lives. Change hearts. We'll give you all the honor and praise for you. These things I ask you most precious and loving you.
kill the Lord I am. Praise him. Praise his name. Praise him. You may be seated.
Oh, glory to God. Amen. Man, awesome. Thank you so much. We certainly appreciate the spirit and the way that you do things as you bless us each week. Please turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 5. As we continue our Working at Worship series, it's been a wonderful a week again. I hope you had a blessed week. We uh, had a great day last, last week, right after the 11 o'clock service. Young man received Christ, and uh, we're so thankful for that. We had the privilege of meeting with another sweet couple at the end of the service, and a, a young lady was standing there waiting on me as we left. To, she'd been following up with her. A new Believer's book and share with me that she was soon probably wanted to be baptized. So it was just a great day. Hope you had a great uh, week this week. We were blessed also Wednesday night, great attendance uh, under the tent and also here in the worship center. More things are beginning to open up for us. So please keep that, uh, stay on top of that. Please come as you can and be a part of those things as well. One of the uh, blessings that I've been able to experience here with the long uh, tenure now uh, about 35 years of ministry 10 as a student pastor now almost 25 as a pastor here is that we're able to focus on what we were designed to do the church was started uh, 94 years ago and they started with a evangelistic movement in the community and we've been able as far as I can tell go back in our history to to see that we, for the most part, have stayed evangelistic through the years and haven't uh, tried to major on minors. We have majored on a major. And that is very, very commendable to you as a church that you're able to do that. Israel is unique in that it began with a calling on one man. And that one man, Abraham, be became a family. And God wanted them to understand they were a family. And no matter how large that they got, they were to have that, that, that family spirit, that family outlook. That family, because of a famine in their land, they, they end up in Egypt. And it began to be a good place. But then uh, during about a 400 year stay, the Egyptians enslaved them. The whole entire family that has now become about 2 million plus has now uh, been put into slavery there in Egypt. And God sends Moses in to redeem them, to get them out of that place, to put them in the right standing that he intended for them to be in. And it is a picture of them coming out of Egypt is the picture of the day we got saved. I want you to know it's, the, it's God bringing us out of sin's bondage into that free place where we could serve him. But here it is about a thousand years later. They are now back, if you will, in a form of captivity. And not only are they in a form of captivity, they have not only been through the Babylonian captivity, but now Persia has defeated Babylon and is heavily taxing the people of God and is telling them how to do things and what to do. They find themselves back in Jerusalem still under some form of captivity. There is a great work that has begun. The temple is now... Uh, been rebuilt, mostly finished. The wall is about half done. They have the gates built, ready to hang. They have half of the rocks, the stones put in place. Things are beginning to be very exciting in the city of Jerusalem. They can envision a time where they can safely worship and they can safely uh, do their farming and the various things. Uh, they can shepherd their sheep, they can raise their crops, and they can go back to a normal life. But right in the middle of all these blessings, Nehemiah has to stop and deal with a very important subject. Somehow, obviously, the people of God have learned some business tricks from the Babylonians. And they have learned how to uh, use one another not in a good way. So Nehemiah has to stop what he's doing and deal with this situation. And he does an excellent 
job with it. Listen, the, the, the focus, the focus, the ability to continue to see people saved uh, relies upon us keeping the focus of what we were designed to do to begin with. It's very, very important that we do that. I'm, I have to, again, commend everyone who has helped us get through this time. No, no, uh, you know, no doing of our own that you come up with a fungus among us like we've had. And, but the people have come out and they, they stay and they clean and they, they come and they run sound systems. All the things it takes, the singers, two services, uh, the, the workers, the, you people in general. You have kept us going financially in every way. We have to commend you for understanding that we have reached some people during this time because of keeping our focus on what the focus is supposed to be on. How to keep a great church great. Would you stand? I feel like we need to read the first 13 verses to get the whole story. There was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. Now you know when, uh, you know as a leader that uh, in their day, uh, women weren't given the position to say a lot in public. This situation was so bad that the, the women took all they could take of this situation. And Nehemiah was wise enough to listen to their cry. For there were those who said, We, our sons, our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses that we may buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards, paying that Persian tax. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. Some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and our vineyards. I, I love this. I love this about Nehemiah. I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words after serious thought I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them each of you is exacting usury from his brother so I called a great assembly against them and I said to them according to our ability we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nation now indeed will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold to us then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, What are you doing? What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this ushery. Restore now to them, even this day, their land, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them and we will do as you say. Then I called the priest and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house, from his property, who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And praise the Lord, then the people did according to this promise. Lord, thank you for blessing us with a, a great church, a, a solid, long-term church that, that has been able to reach people. Lord, we celebrate that, but we understand the enemy without, and, and Lord, apathy within is, will constantly come against us if we don't recognize it and do something about it. Help us to love each other. Help us to follow you. Help us to be used for your glory until you come. Save someone today, Lord, like you did last week. Save someone for your glory today. You be honored in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. How to keep a great church great. God desires simply that we treat other people like he treats us, which that would be a grace economy. That would be a grace standing with other people. 
Warren Wiersbe said, when the church is least like the world, it does the most for the world. It is a different economy than the culture outside the church. We need to understand that. They had learned probably from the Babylonians how to uh, use people in the wrong way for profit. Some of them had. And they began to do that in such a way that it stifled the ability of some of the people to do what they wanted to do, which was raise their crops, shepherd their sheep, have their own way of making a living. And being they, yes, they knew they had to pay the tax, but they needed to be able to do it and be able to survive without being in some form of bondage. We need to understand as a great church, we have been delivered from the bondage of sin. No matter what we do, no matter what decision we make, no matter how we set up things in the future, it's got to be about people becoming free in the gospel. If it's not, then we become much less than what we were called to, to be. You, you show me churches that no longer reach people, and I'll show you somewhere down the line where they gave up on the power of the gospel and its ability to reconcile people, sinners, to a holy God and the, the restoration and uh, the be, being able for people to be restored in a way that God could use them. I want to very quickly give you five things that I pinned down this week as I studied how to keep a great church great. The things that Nehemiah brought up that had to be put back in place for them to go forward. First of all, be a family. Verse 7, he says, you're doing this to your own brothers. This is your family that you are picking on here. Well, uh, according to the scriptures, we are family the moment we are born again. There's not, it's not something that you grow in to become. You become part of the family of God the moment by faith you receive the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes no difference uh, your background or, or what nation you're from or whatever, where you stand financially. When you receive Christ, you become a part of the family of God. First of all, Jesus said we must be born into the family. You're born again. You are born into the family, but it even goes deeper and better than that. Last, uh, a few weeks ago, a young lady received Christ at home, and this morning in the 11 o'clock service, I had to get, I tell Bray, you got to keep me straight what I'm doing at 9, what I'm doing at 11, but at 11 o'clock service, at the beginning, we'll get to baptize her this morning, she received Christ, and she was born, now she was born physically, but the other day at home, she was born spiritually into the family of God, but listen to this, not only was she born into the family of God, but according to the scripture, the, the Lord adopted her. Now, what does it mean to be adopted? Ephesians 1, 5, we are adopted. What does that mean? That means that, that young girl, I think she's nine years old, she was immediately given adult status spiritually. She was given adult status spiritually. One of the things that, that we've tried to do for, for a long time here is that we treat our children here and our teenagers, our preteens, and our, our, our folks that are now college age or they're working a job or they're in school, whatever. We treat them like adults. You say, now, brother, Mike, here, now here's what I mean by that. Like when we uh, begin our van ministry back in a few weeks, if you'll notice the way we treat our children that are on the van, we treat them like God's got big plans for their lives. In other words, we tell them that, we treat them that way, and then you'll watch them that are long-term as they begin to serve here in the church. Because we didn't tell them we, were, we brought you here to babysit you, and we didn't tell them, hey, when you, maybe when you graduate high school or when you graduate college, you can invest in the church and do something. No, we start telling our children at a very young age, we want you to be in the Word of God, and we want you to find out how you're wired, and we want you to start serving the Lord at an early age so you won't walk away from the church when you do grow up. See, we're given adult status, but no matter what our age is, 
We're given adult status the moment we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That's adoption. You are a part of the family. Second, in Hebrews 2.11, it says that Jesus is not ashamed to call us family. Because in Christ, we are family. We are family. I, I've got to say to you that I probably am closer in general to people here in the, in the church than I am some of my, at least my extended family. It's just the way that it is. If you spend as many years as we have here, you, you develop family in the house of God. And it's supposed to be that way. I'm supposed to hurt when you hurt. And I'm supposed to rejoice with you when you rejoice. There's nothing perfect about a family. But we do stick together and we do serve the Lord together. Verse 9 Nehemiah said, I love this language, what you are doing is not good. I have to say to you, at 20 years old, when I was invited to this church, one of the, one of the things I needed in my life was to be, because I'd always felt like when I came up uh, in church as a little boy and we got out of church, and one of the things I couldn't stand as a little boy about church, where I came from, they fought a lot. I mean, I say a lot enough to turn me off from church, okay? Like uh, their, their conferences, their business meetings were very, uh, you know, it was testy at least. And I just noticed there was something wrong in that church, even as a little boy. And I was so glad we got out of church when I was a little boy, believe it or not. I was glad. I was like, well, good, relief. So when I was invited to come back to church here at 20 years old, I was very, uh, you know, I wondered what it would be like. And I realized there is such a thing as love in the house of God. People did love me even as a lost person. Loved me right into the altar where I got saved. It has to be that way. A great church will be a family. Secondly, keep redemption as the focus. He appeals to their knowledge of the exodus. Verse 8. You guys know that we were once slaves ourselves how is it that God brought us out with a heavy hand and, and and now we're going to treat each other and put each other back in some form of bondage that is not good he says what you were doing he appeals to their if you will their freedom in the past and a church that's going to stay focused as I said early has to stand on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason we show up for church, the reason we reach out to people, the reason we still have an invitation. Robin and I were at a church uh, just a few weeks ago on vacation. We went to a little church. It was outside. And on the way back to our room, Robin said, Did you notice they didn't have an invitation? I said, I certainly do. I did that, and I've noticed that churches are dying, but ours is not going to die. As long as we have church, or I'm the pastor, we're going to have a time of response. Even if nobody comes, we're still going to ask you, because why the whole Bible is an invitation to get right with the God who created you and who sent His Son to die for you. Keep redemption as the focus. Matthew 28, 19, what does it say to do? Go Make disciples. Simple, isn't it? Go make disciples. Now, going is anywhere beyond where you're already standing. It doesn't matter if you take two steps and share the gospel or you go to Africa and share the gospel. It matters not. Go and share the gospel. Make disciples. A church's daily practices and weekly practices our budgets, our decisions we make of what to build, what not to build, should be based on whether we're going to reach more people or not. If we're not going to reach more people, what we do, let's save us all the trouble and, and not do anything. But I tell you, if we're going through what we've been through and we're still seeing people being reached, I got a feeling this church has got a great, great future if we'll stay focused on redemptive purposes that the Lord Jesus Christ has started. Be a family and be redemptive. But thirdly, he asked him a question. Do you not walk in the fear of God? 
Do you not walk in the fear of God? See, a great church will always honor God. It will always honor God. He is saying, listen, this thing that you're doing, did you not consider that God would be against that practice that you have put in place? Are you no longer afraid of God that you will put your own brothers and sisters, young men and young women, into this position? He asked. Do you not fear God? Chuck Swindoll said, to fear the Lord means to seek to glorify God in everything we do. Now, we're fallen. We're not perfect. But to seek to glorify God in everything we do is vital for the believer to get up in the morning, get in the Word of God, pray to the God of heaven, the one who redeemed you, get your purpose for the day, get your walking orders, go out of the house, whatever it is you're doing, and be a witness for the Lord. Fear God. Let me tell you some of the stuff that you put up with in a great church. The other day, I don't know, uh, two or three weeks ago, I lose track of time. I'm on my way out, and again, I think it was the 11 o'clock service, not sure. And I had a meeting set up immediately after church, just like we do today with the precious family, and a man stopped me right in that, right in that little aisle right there, and here's what he said. I, anybody in the church need a car? I said, well, probably. Probably that somebody's always. I said, "How much? You know, you know." I'm just being this man. The man is, "Well, how much do you want for?" It? I'm trying to get onto my thing, and I pin it down, and I. It's usually to help. He said, "Oh no, it's, it's free. I want to give it to somebody." Is anybody in the church need a car? I said, "Well, absolutely. I, I know a young man that could use a car. He's he's struggling, trying to get school started, and he's working. And, and yes, you see what I'm saying? In a great church." People have have put their priorities into place. And they begin to bless other people and and to bless the gospel ministry. And and that is what you put up with when you're leading a solid, long-term, great church. See, this problem that Nehemiah was dealing with is based on greed. They weren't happy just being well off. They, they went after the weakest among them and began to, to abuse them instead of blessing them. Look, these people weren't asking for a handout. They, they wanted their farm. They had farms. They were raising crops. They had sheep. And they wanted to be able to go and do what the things that had been passed down to them to be able to do. That's all they were asking for. You'll never outgive God. Don't you understand? If you're a person that is bent on, on being afraid financially, what I want you to understand something. That in order to honor God, you cannot be stingy. You cannot be greedy. And honestly, you cannot be fearful with the things God has blessed you with. As sure as the sun rose. This morning, it will rise again in the morning, and you will not do without for the things you need. Next thing I saw, we protect our standing in the community. He asked him in verse 9, do you not think that our enemies haven't heard what we're doing to each other here in Jerusalem? Do you not think when they find out that we are actually uh, abusing one another, that it causes them to disrespect us even more. They do not fear us and our army, and they do not fear the God of heaven as long as they find out we are more about greed and hypocrisy than we are being a faith family who blesses one another. Several years ago, I saw in the paper a young man that I did not know, and he doesn't attend church here, But he was arrested somewhere in Anniston for theft. And he had on one of our Leatherwood softball shirts. And I figure somebody, you know, took it to a thrift store, whatever. It doesn't matter. But I thought, man, that that is not good. You know what I mean? That is not good. But I must say to you, and I I don't, again, I try to stay away from legalism. But I've got to tell you. That when you become a part of our church, and when you become a part of the family of God, you are representing 
our church. You are an ambassador. Whatever we say we're about, if you're not about that away from here, you're hurting the cause more than you're helping the cause. Be careful where you go. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you say. And, and guard your own heart. That's why I tell you, get in the Word every day and guard your own heart with the Word of God so we can flesh out and protect our standing in the community. The church is not in the same economy as the world. We have got to be different. Or, or if not, we convince the world that we're no different than they are. And why should they be a part of a living church if we're no different than they are? And then last, how to keep. A great church, great. Lead by example. Lead by example. Nehemiah told them in verses 10 and 11. He told them what to do. And then he told them what he was doing. He said, I'm not charging usury. I am not charging interest. I am literally giving folks some money. They're going to pay me back. Again, this is not a system of handouts and laziness. They're going to pay me back, but he said, I want to get them through this time because he could see as the wall was going up and would be finished and the temple worship was going to be thriving again and they'd, they'd be protected and be able to raise their crops and have their, uh, their animals that they would be a thriving nation once again. The church at Corinth was having the Lord's Supper. And Paul had to get on to them because inside the church, though this was a redemptive service, in other words, you're, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And what does he say? Remember my death. Remember the high price that was paid for you to be free. But they began to break up in classes and in groups the rich folk would bring a lot of food with them that had nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. And the poor folks who had been invited to church, they didn't have anything. And Paul got all over them for making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. Lead by example. It makes no difference where you stand financially or your background or your skin color or what you used to do when you was a sinner like me. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about being an example to a dying world. That, that the church is alive. We are redemptive in our purpose. And we lead by example. As we get ready to offer a time of response. Listen. We need everyone to have their hands on the wall. This is a wall that every stone is made out of a person who has received the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're building that wall. Many in Jerusalem felt that they had lost their lives. Nehemiah led them to a better, better place. Jesus wants to give you your life back today. Would you pray with me? Jesus wants to give you your life back today, just like Nehemiah led the people of God to begin to show redemptive purpose once again. I want you to know something. I was here just a little over 39 years ago as a 20-year-old young man, lost without hope, lost without hope, popular Yes, plenty of money, worked hard, a lot of friends, a lot of folks I thought were my friends, empty, without a purpose, unsaved, dead because of sin. Somebody invited me to hear the good news that Jesus Christ had taken a perfect life one that fulfilled God's law and he laid down on a Roman cross 
and he died paying my penalty. They buried him, but he was larger and stronger than death. And he rose the third day. After about the third sermon, I got saved. It changed the trajectory of my life. My wife got saved here while we were engaged. My sons have been saved here. My daddy got saved here. I've had a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law that got saved here. You better believe, I believe, in a strong, great, solid church who is redemptive in its purpose. Jesus will save you today. When we stand, you come. Lord, you be glorified in this time of response. Give folks the courage to come and to talk to you today. We'll praise you for the outcome in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand. You have a need today. You come. Admit your need for Christ. Believe that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was for you personally. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Commit your life to his lordship. Doors of the church are open. If it's the church God is sending you to, you come. Let us get you started on your journey as we sing. Jealous Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. Hey. like your life is taken from you he wants to give it back start with freedom in Christ yes I love this song
so much for joining in with us this morning in our live stream service. We'd love to invite you to come on campus, get that place where you can do that, 9 o'clock and also 11 o'clock. We've seen brand new faces every week. We're very excited for, for that happening. We do have plenty of space, so please be, come and be a part of that. Also, we've also started some of our small groups on Sunday morning. And we're more and more of those opening up every week. We'd love you to come and join in on that as well. We put out a little publication explaining uh, that we're putting your hand of the classes that we got, where they're at. We move some of those around to give us more space, but we'll be glad to take care of that and to explain that to you if you'll just come. Also on Wednesday night, we have a our youth service, and we call it a family service because a lot of our families come in with their uh, young folks and uh, Brother Bray Priest is right there in the worship center. Also, we have a Bible study on the Big Tent. We're, we're really fired up about that and had a good, uh, a good crowd there for that this past week. So thank you so much. We'd love for you to come. We do that at 6.30 on Wednesdays. Let me also thank you again for those that are giving. A lot of folks are sending in. Some folks are giving it here uh, in our uh, in-church service, but also you can give online as well. So thank you for that. We've been very excited about generosity of folks and helping us out we get a lot of stuff done this time please come and join us any way that you can we'd love to see you again next sunday or wednesday night god bless you and have a great day